Um, there we go. Okay, start again. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, my name's Anna and I am a campaigner at Friends of the Earth on the Act on Climate Collective. And I'm going to be the MC for tonight's event on the future of firefighting in Victoria. Um, and as we kick off, um, I was just saying it's always really important to acknowledge um, that we're all on Aboriginal land, um, you know, whenever we're talking about um, climate and environmental protection um, and, you know, gathering in any form across this ancient continent. Um, but I think it's especially important tonight to acknowledge that First Nations people were the first fire managers of this country um, and developed ecologically sensitive techniques to care for the land for tens of thousands of years. And, you know, the climate crisis is really um, a, a signal to us that we are very currently out of tune with the, the Earth's rhythms and being able to... Um, listen to it and live sustainably within its cycles. And um, we know that we need to put First Nations knowledge about how to tend to landscapes with fire back into practice um, on a larger scale. Um, I think that, you know, uh, we're a couple of weeks into summer and that um, as we're entering another El Nino period, we're all very apprehensive of what bushfire season will bring and what it's already bringing for people um, in northern states of Australia. Um, and, you know, like we know that climate change is supercharging bushfire seasons all over the world to the point that even when it's not our fire season here, we're seeing fires engulf other countries um, in, you know, in the northern hemisphere um, and other continents. Um, so it's yeah really topical to talk about about right now and to bring together a diversity of perspectives on how we can modernize and strengthen our firefighting capacity um, and particularly how we can do that with the goal of protecting our precious biodiversity that is ever more at risk from the climate crisis. So a uh, quick little bit of background, Friends of the Earth has been working in the space of fire policy for quite a few years now. And we also have uh, multiple members of staff who are CFA volunteers in their communities. So, you know, bringing that kind of both on the ground and eagle eye perspective. And later we'll share some ideas about um, what we are pitching to the Victorian government to do to strengthen firefighting. Um, I will note as to the topic of the event that this is primarily about how we fight fires tonight and not the broader kind of question of fire management and making landscapes less flammable. Um, but we are really keen to keep talking about this and do a more focused session on that uh, next year, including with a stronger kind of focus on First Nations fire management. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes for people that didn't hear me before, if you've just joined. Um, please put your questions that you have for the panellists in the chat throughout the night uh, and we'll collect them and I'll field them to the presenters um, at, when they've all finished speaking um, and try and get through as many as possible. Um, and yeah, I guess a final note, um, I'm not a fire expert, just a, just a climate campaigner who's become a bit of a fire nerd recently and um, deeply cares about our wild places that are more and more threatened by fire. Um, my favourite places that are currently very under threat are the snow gum forests of the Victorian Alps, um, and we'll talk a bit about um, them later as well. Um, but yeah, I'm just here to, you know, introduce our wonderful speakers who have donated their time tonight and direct all of your excellent questions to them. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Sarah Harris, who is the Manager of Research and Development and Fire Risk um, and Community Preparedness at the Country Fire Authority. So um, Sarah's already onto it, sharing the screen, and I will throw to Sarah to um, open us uh, up for the night. Excellent, thank you. You can hear me all right? It's all on screen, wonderful, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk tonight. Um, 
I'm certainly not a firefighter either, but I do work for the Country Fire Authority. Um, my background's in research, in research and in, um, in really looking at fire and climate relationships. Also a fire behaviour analyst during the fire season to help sort of detect and predict where these fires might go when they're going to help firefighters on the ground um, get onto the fires quickly and, and help decision makers. Uh, so today I've been invited to talk about climate change and bushfires. Some of you might have been involved in the Nature uh, Conservation Conference earlier in the, the year and I sort of gave cap Nature Conservation Council Conference earlier in the year. So you may have seen some of these slides before, so sorry about that. Um, so just kicking off, we've only got a, a short window to speak, so I'm getting straight to the point. Um, probably don't need to reinforce this too much with this audience, but as we know, um, climate change, uh, it's unequivocal now that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land. It's halted our global weather patterns, and that's resulting into a whole host of, of flow-on effects of more infrequent, more frequent and intense extreme weather events, such as heat waves, droughts, large storms. Um, and that's it has already and will continue to impact health, economies, livelihoods, infrastructure, and societies. And um, under all emission scenarios, it's expected that that surface temperature will continue to rise. Um, until at least the mid-century. And I think the, the COP meeting in Dubai, I think it's probably wrapped up now, but I, I, I think the discussion is around uh, 2023 being the um, hottest on record again. We're, we're making, you know, hitting this, hitting these extremes again. And, and this information is from the last IPCC. Um, focusing in on Victoria, we've already experienced increasing temperature and decreasing cool season rainfall. Um, and that's projected to, to worsen. And so that's going to have a, a, quite a few flow on effects like doubling of hot, very hot days, sea level rising, more intense uh, downpours, a decline in cool season rainfall, and also uh, longer and more extreme fire seasons, which is what I'm going to touch on now. Um, so some of the, the influences of climate change are, are, are much easier to the, what, what will be the implications, but for for bushfires, it's it's more complex because there's a whole range of uh, parameters that drive vegetation fires. Um, and that makes it then even harder to sort of adapt and prepare in terms of bushfire management if we're unsure of how bushfires are going to change. Uh, so some of the key drivers of vegetation fires include the weather conditions, the hot, dry and windy conditions to help spread the fire. We need a source of ignition, whether it's human related and, or lightning. Uh, we need the fuel to burn um, and, and that, that brings all of it together, the amount, the structure, the connectivity of the vegetation all plays a role in vegetation fires. And then the flammability of the, of the fuel, how dry is this vegetation? And so it is complex how those things will change under climate change and I'll have a look at some of these. Um, so in terms of fire weather, that one's been a little bit more uh, straightforward than some of the other some of the other drivers. Um, we've seen uh, extreme fire weather has increased over um, over Australia. If you look at that plot on the on the right, a red dot means it's been an increasing trend in fire weather, um, and the bigger the dot, the bigger the trend. And if there's blue dots, it's a downward trend. So as you can see, mostly we're seeing an upward trend, and the and the biggest change is happening. Uh, these are these are separated by seasons and SON means uh, September, October, November and that's spring. And so we're seeing the biggest change happening in the, the south of the country and particularly uh, in spring and summer, which um, yeah, important periods for, for drying out our landscapes. Um, we're seeing so and so that's what we've observed and then we've looked at sort of projecting that forward how fire weather might change and we've found uh, through uh, 12 different uh, climate climate uh, models that we're looking at a 10 to 20 percent increase in in fire weather over the century. Um, we're also starting to see the fire season starting earlier. And so some studies that I've looked at and also look, um, the Bureau of Meteorology and CSRO are finding that the fire season is looking like it's starting one to three months earlier. Of course, there's plenty of variability with that. And then st st looking like it's um, extending at the other side, but just don't, that's much minor compared to the, the start of the fire season. Um, we've looked also, studies have looked at how uh, sort of in that ignition space it's really hard to project how human ignited uh, ignitions will change but in terms of lightning it's there's other ways we can look at that one of them is dry lightning and another area is sort of that pyroconvection risk factor so that's the stability of the atmosphere 
Um, and so those, uh, those drivers of, of prior convection risk um, have been found to be increasing and also uh, are projected to worsen. And so that, that leads to dangerous conditions for our firefighters and communities. Um, and also with the, if there's a likely increase in dry lightning, we, we may see that increase in, in lightning caused ignitions if the, if the other um, drivers all align. We're looking at dry landscapes. So we've got, we've got this potential because we're, we're seeing and we're projecting higher temperatures and also reduced rainfall, um, particularly in those coolest, cooler season months. So that's, and then we've also got um, projections of more frequent and hotter hot days, heat waves, exacerbating drought conditions. So all of these things may lead to more flammable vegetation. Um, and that means it can more easily ignite and carry fire. And for Victoria, if, when we have those hot, dry springs, we're usually followed by those bigger, more significant fire seasons, those big fires that, that uh, can keep, keep going and, and we can't uh, get on top of. Um, and then the last driver is the, the biomass, the vegetation, and that's really complex about how that might change. And there's still a lot of uncertainty because each fuel type responds differently to all the variables. So how will they respond to higher temperatures, the cool season rainfall decline? Um, we, we usually think more atmospheric CO2 um, it will lead to increased vegetation response. Um, higher fire frequency and severity, how will the vegetation respond? You can see those pictures in the bottom right. You know, that's an extreme change to the landscape. How does that vegetation come back? It often doesn't come back the same way. Um, so will we see those shifts? And, I, I, and on the top right, we actually do have a project underway um, that's looking at how vegetation types might change across Victoria, uh, given um, the, these climate change projections. And, and the, I mean, of course, there's lots of uncertainty to these results, but there are, there are some areas that they're looking like, you know, those wetter forests are going to be drier or turning shrubby, and that's really concerning for all of us in many ways, but also um, in terms of that fire risk going forward. Um, so lots of implications for the fire regime. Um, so sort of bringing all that together, hotter and drier conditions, worrying about more flammable fuels, a longer fire season, those flammable fuels are, are, for, are for longer, um, that increased power of convection risk, lightning ignited fires, we're worrying about more fires and more extreme bushfire conditions. And all that combination of above, there's that concern about high severity fires, threatening, you know, vegetation species persistence and, and, and that feedback on the fire regime. Broader implications from a, a fire management perspective and for the community is really that increasing exposure and vulnerability of, of communities to hazards, the, the increasing cost of disasters and the impacts on infrastructure. Supply chain vulnerabilities, um, damage to the ecosystem, of course. And then for, for us, really that increasing pressure on resourcing responders and capabilities. So it's not just the personnel, equipment, trucks, infrastructure, aircraft. It's also all those support services that go with providing that. So that all the training that these people need and looking after health and wellbeing. And, and that last point there, really important, the health and safety of, of staff and volunteers for, for mental health, fatigue and, and heat stress. Um, I think, uh, how am I doing for time? Am I running out? I made a slide that was a quicker, and there, there's still a lot we can do, I guess, is the point I wanted to make. And, and so I've got a lot of adaptation um, ideas. Um, and there's, so there's a lot we can do, but I thought I'd better, better summarise in case I ran out of time. I think there's lots we can do in enhancing community engagement initiatives, optimising vegetation management approaches, making sure we're innovating, exploring new technologies, Increasing capacity and ca capability, it's not all about more, more, more. It's, you know, maybe upskilling and changing, um, really being open to adopting different approaches to bushfire management. Um, learning from what we do and I'm um, manager of research and development. So I have to say, of course, invest in research and development to support all of these activities. Um, and I'll leave it there with the key messages, knowing I hope I kept to time. Thank you. Awesome, very succinct. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we might just take it off your screen share so we can um, switch to the next person. But um, thank you so much for um, yeah kicking things off and giving us that overview. Um, it's really great to open it up with all your knowledge, and I think you know also good for us all to keep in mind that 
the majority of firefighting in Victoria is done by people who are donating their time to do that and to think about, you know, it's really quite scary that as conditions worsen, it's volunteers that are at the forefront defending their communities. Um, so, yeah, it's really great to see the, the CFA looking into all these new ideas. Um, I'm trying I, to stop sharing it. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you, there should be a stop share button that sometimes jumps around. Oh, no, I can do it. I oh, great. It. I can, <laughs> that was very be, odd. Thank you. It can be MC overlord. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thanks, Sarah. And um, without further ado, I would like to now introduce Ben Mallinson, who is the program manager at JARA, um, which is looking into the use of cultural fire to heal Jar Jar Wurrung country in um, central Victoria. So thank you, Ben, over to you. Thanks, Anna. Um, everybody can hear okay. Yeah, yep, awesome. And thank you, Sarah, for um, your presentation and being first, um, first, first up is always um, a, a challenge, but I um, appreciate you doing that and um, all that you presented on. Um, so I, just to give a bit of an intro, I guess, so I, I um, am living in Castle Maine on Jundak and Jaja Warren country, um, have been doing so for about a year and, and was was living in Melbourne before that for around 13 years on the Wurundjeri country largely um, but originally from New Zealand, Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, Maori, Scottish, English descent but have um, lived here for you know good the, the large majority of my adult life and, and somehow found my way into health and human services, um, families, fairness and housing and, and government context management consulting and, and now working to um, with Jaja Warung to set up their their cultural burning program. Um, so I to give a bit of framing before going into some, some aspects of that, I'll just you know acknowledge I'm, I'm here not as a as a jar man speaking for particular cultural matters I'm, I'm here to talk about the program the priorities of the program and the things that are within I guess the the cultural remit that I have to share and and if I can't share about things or I don't have that authority I won't um, go into to any of those you know those kinds of matters um, so just think it's important to kind of get that framing, I guess, and um, and also to acknowledge the the ancestors, past, present, and emerging um, of this place that I'm that I'm at in Judge of Warren Country, but with all the places that you're um, you're tuning in from, where, wherever that wherever that is, because there's quite a few people on. Um, I think I, I reckon Sarah probably gave a lot of a lot of the you know technical information and cold hard facts and things that, that we're all we all have to to live with this is all part of our reality and no matter where you are like this is this is what we're we're here to talk about right so I feel like I don't need to go into probably any of the detail about that kind of background um I guess in terms of talking about Jara's program of cultural burning or traditional owner led burning so in the the year ending financial year of um, June this year, so the the twelve months prior, um, that was Jara's biggest burning period since the, the, like, the, becoming an organisation and since the program began. So, we had twenty four burn ignition days across a range of different land tenures and about fourteen different locations, whether on Crown land, majority through the Joint Fuel Management Program. Um, other jar of freehold properties and then different collaboration arrangements and a, a collaboration with CFA more recently um, for the Frog Ponds, Burns and Coomba Night Street and Bendigo, which was also a really awesome partnership and collaboration. So that's just some of the, the, the aspects of what we've done as a program and we're looking to have a much bigger year again next year. Um, but I guess there are many benefits um, that you could attribute to, to cultural fire. 
But probably the main ones I wanted to talk to today is really the social and spiritual aspects of, of burning, um, burning and land management in a, in a general sense, and how primary and fundamental I, I think that actually is. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the context that I'm talking about in, in Jara is we have very small teams doing very big things, both in our forest gardening strategy and in our cultural burning program. And if you compare resources to put on similar size or scale burning programs in government departments, whether that's DECA or otherwise, you know, really we have a, a, a team of around 10 overall in both the policy and the forestry and fire crew. Uh, with a casual pool outside of that. So, so what we pull off or have pulled off to date is um, pretty significant uh, for, for the resources that we have. So I guess the, the reason I try to illustrate that is we've got small teams doing very big things and how does that happen? Um, how does that happen effectively? So I think that's really about the, the relationships, the, the way that we try to be at the forefront with each other of having really... Um, cooperative relationships, but then also with all of our external partners, cross teams with our cultural heritage teams, with whoever we need to interact with. Um, how do we have relationships that are, that are open and transparent and, and um, you know, cooperative and constructive? So I think one of the things I'm trying to get at in terms of the broader cultural experience when we do go out to Burns and we have people together and we have some food together and then we go and, and we um, we have a smoking ceremony and, and then we spend time together putting fire into country and, and having that social connection to each other is, I guess, around healing fire and the healing capacity of fire. So regardless of what type of um, burning it is, whether it's a CFA program or a DECA plant burn program or a burn off at a farm somewhere or a JARA led burn um, under joint fuel management program or otherwise is really about the intrinsic relationships um, of fire as I see it. So there's the relationship of people to each other, but people to country as well and everything that comes with that, um, walking together with those different elements and um, I guess, reintegrating or trying to reconnect the experience of community to fire because fire has always been a part of this landscape and people and fire together has, has always been a thing here as well for, for many thousands of years. Um, and Jara being it, 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 where, where I am, you know, being the, the leaders of, of, of that, um, that practice and that, that philosophy, I guess. So I think... Coming back to the, the relationships aspect, um, one last thing I'd sort of think about is within different strunk structures, I guess, um, whether that's dealing with government partners or community organisations or environmental um, activist organisations. I guess a question that I, that I would ask, you know, for people just to kind of take away and think about is what is constructive and cooperative leadership? Um, and communication across agencies and across anybody that has a vested interest in fire, which I would say we all do in, in different ways, but also for the organisations that we work in. What is constructive and cooperative leadership and communication um, to achieve or, or further whatever we need to, you know, in, in response to quite existential issues and, and effects that we're all um, a part of and how do we model that behaviour, um, regardless of the, the part of the puzzle that we play, how do we model um, that? I guess I just hope I'm also not going over time either. Um, no, you're just, all good. Come let's, yeah, uh, let me just have a water. Mm. Um, you know, I'd give one example of that, like Dika and, and Jara have a very close relationship in the, the regions that we work in, and, and it can be pretty high stress, you know, during fire delivery periods. And sometimes we can have um, butting heads about different things. Do you want to maybe sort of sit behind risk models and behind desktop analysis? And we are asking them to come out on country with us and to, to think about decision-making processes and communication processes in a different way. And that is not 
easy to do and and sometimes you you want to um react in a, in a different way but one of the things that i've certainly learned from most of my staff and um judge Loring and particularly jara folk that that i've worked with is really about being focused on how to have good partnership and good constructive um cooperative communication and to keep it positive and um and focused on the long game so that's that's something that i've taken to heart and trying to work with some of the more difficult circumstances that we're in um i hope that gives a little bit of a background or an overview of the program and looking forward to hearing from um, other speakers today as well thank you And thank you so much, Ben, for coming on and sharing a bit about the Cultural Fire program. Um, it's really great to have your perspective included in this because, yeah, though the general topic tonight is a bit more limited to firefighting, um, as you know, I think everyone's noted so far, um, it's just like really crucial to have that broader picture of um, fire management and uh, you know, the aspects of First Nations fire management that are about building relationships with people and the land and honouring that sovereignty um, and that, yeah, really deep connection and understanding of um, how fire works in the, all the different landscapes here. Um, so, yeah, I hope we can look into that a lot more um, next year as well with some more focused uh, conversations on that through Friends of the Earth and really appreciate you coming on tonight. Uh, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Phil Zilstra, who is a fire behavior scientist and um, adjunct associate professor at Curtin Uni. Um, Phil's going to uh, talk to us about how an improved understanding of fire behavior can guide more safer and more effective deployment of remote area firefighting resources. So over to you, Phil. Hi everyone, I'll just try and get this. Yep, looks like you got my my presentation up there. Yeah, so I I came from a background as a remote area firefighter and working in fire management and came into research from that. And so I had always from the beginning a, a focus on trying to uh, to find ways of actually fixing the problems that I saw on the ground. And um, I've, I've been modeling fire behavior since that time. And the the model that I've built was initially sort of developed by working uh, on, on the fire ground, talking through the way the fire was behaving with other firefighters and um, and you know, just asking, you know, why do you think it that plant burnt that way? You know, how, how did that happen? And then coming up with the maths and the physics um, that fit what we were seeing and um, and fit the general trends. And so um, I've, in the title there, I've got this, this term cooperation with country. And that's an area that has come out of that fire behaviour modelling where what I did was um, eventually I found that really it came down to the species of plants and the and the growth stages of those plants and that's what drove fire behavior and so it varies completely uh, from one patch of bush to another and we can't all just characterize it with the simple metrics that we'd like to use um, and cooperation with country has two aspects to it that I'm going to go into um, one of them is uh, what I call reconciliation, which is is basically just understanding how uh, how fire works in that particular country and adjusting ourselves to that. And that's a really necessary thing because we we come into this country, um, our fire management is still something that has arisen out of a, a paradigm as as colonizers, as invaders, and and we have a a mentality of a sort of a domination paradigm in that and so um this is 
this is the understanding I got, I suppose, from a number of different um, elders who were generous enough with their knowledge to open my eyes over the last last few decades. And that is that as you move into new country, um, you need to come into that country essentially as, you know, almost like an infant, as somebody who doesn't know the fire for that country, even if you were the fire expert um, just across the river. You need to um, you need to reconcile yourself with that new country. So that's reconciliation, and the second part of it is reinforcement, and that's where our firefighting comes in. But we can't get the reinforcement without first reconciling with the country. So I'll just go through those things quickly and what that means. So in um, in 2019, there was uh, an ignition to the northwest of Sydney. Um, that when it was first found, it was about four hectares in size. I've got it circled up there in the northwest, up in the Wallamai wilderness. Um, now, it was a little bit too windy to get um, crews out there at the time, um, but the next day was a calm day. It was around, you know, low 20s. It was a beautiful day for remote area firefighting. Um, but by that time, the fire had grown to nearly 30 hectares. And now there is a principle um, that's often brought up in um, in fire management that when you have, this is the fire history here, all of these grey areas are areas that were burnt within the last six years. So there's it's right on the western edge of about 100,000 hectares of very recently burnt forest. And there's a principle that is often raised, with, with, um, you know, prioritization of ignitions you you can downgrade the priority of some ignitions if they're surrounded by recently burnt forest because the fuel loads are lower and um, and that allows you to focus on uh, the fires that were happening at the same time which were a whole lot of fires threatening the towns and burning down houses along the eastern seaboard uh, the problem is that post-fire analysis showed that um, yeah, fuels uh, straight after fire, you did have a period of lower risk of crown fire. That's the y axis here. This is the likelihood of crown fire, but it only lasted for about two years. And after that, um, all forests were more flammable than those forests that had never been burnt. Greater likelihood of crown fire. And so, as a result, they weren't able to contain that fire. They only had four raft, four remote area fire crews to send out there um, and weren't able to contain that fire with those resources because the behaviour was more extreme than expected. And as a, result, as a result, we got the largest single ignition forest fire in Australian history. Uh, so none of that, there's no point in pointing the finger back on that. The question is, how do we readjust to that reality how could that have turned out differently and a, and a big part of that is if we had had the remote area fire crews to send out there at the time and if we had known that that area of a hundred thousand hectares of reduced fuels was actually more flammable than the way the forest had been to start with then perhaps we may have been able to prioritize enough remote area crews out there to contain that fire while it was small all of these things are great in hindsight, but we don't have to rely on hindsight if we reconcile ourselves with country and with the way fire works in country. And that's why I've developed the fire research and modelling environment frame, which, which looks at how uh, fire behaviour is governed by the species of plants and by their structure. And one of the really simple takeaways from this is, um, is, is a a fairly universal rule that we're finding across country. And that is if you if you start out with you know low plants burning, you get low flames. And but the bigger those plants are, the bigger the flames you get. And none of that's particularly contentious. Now the thing is though, you notice in the background here the trees aren't burning. And that was the case over those black summer fires. Uh, for about 88% of that landscape, the trees weren't burning. 
And while trees and any taller plants aren't burning, they're actually slowing the wind speed underneath them, which calms the fire down. Um, now, this feeds into an important reality because it means that plants, you know, we, we often talk about um, increasing vegetation as being an increasing fire risk. But in reality, plants can be a fire risk if they're small and close to the ground or they can slow the fire down if they're large and out of reach of the flames, as happened in 88% of the time over the black summer. And so that then raises an interesting ecological question um, because there's this principle that Ray Speck brought up back in the 80s, I think that, you know, and, and it's a, it's kind of an obvious one if you think about it. If you If you take out a large plant, you create a vacancy and small plants come back. And so you take out a large plant that is what I call overstory shelter, one of these tall ones that isn't burning um, and is slowing the fire down, and it gets replaced by smaller plants that will burn and will create fuel. But the reverse of that is also true, that as those plants get older and get taller, uh, they may themselves, those, those tall shrubs, may now get tall enough that they are too tall to burn. You think of some of the, the wattles and things that you see in tall forests that are long unburnt. Um, they tend not to burn themselves as the fire comes through. The fire burns underneath them. And what that also does is that those plants now outcompete the plants underneath them. In some forests, that means you get a completely or nearly completely open understory. In others, it means you get very mesic species, um, you know, rainforest species, tree ferns, that sort of thing. Um, but generally a much less flammable understory with a, um, a much stronger protection of overstory shelter. And this is what I've called ecological control theory. It's basically, it's these processes that have enabled forests to limit fire impact since the days of Gondwana. And it's the reason why we have fire sensitive species that survived all of that time forests naturally place limits on fire in the landscape. And that's a big part of what is called reconciliation. In Kosciuszko National Park, when the fires started there, there were literally no firefighters free to contain those fires in remote country. And they stopped by themselves. And so a big part of what I'm doing is looking at exactly why it was that those fires stopped. What caused that to happen? Because that has been the case throughout the mapped history of fires across the Australian Alps. The least likely places to burn are the places that have been burned uh, least often. When you burn a forest, you convert that overstory shelter into regrowth. So you get a short period of reduced fire risk at the beginning. And then you get a pulse of flammable regrowth where the, those plants are trying to regrow. And eventually that forest matures and contains fire again. And so understanding how that works for different forest types and where the lines are on it allows us to move into this final stage of reinforcement. Uh, so this is a, an a area of tallow wood forest on the um, Dorigo Plateau in northern New South Wales. Uh, estimated 700 years since fire in that area. Um, now, I surveyed that um, and did some modelling with frame to look at how fire would behave there. And what you can see is in the second column there, you look at flame height. And these are different percentiles, so the, the likelihood of those different flames happening. And under nearly the whole range of conditions, flames are quite small. And frame predictions disagreed, uh, uh, differed significantly from the two other main fire models. The Cheney model, which is Project Vesta, is the, the box on the left. And the MacArthur model, which, which also underpins Phoenix, um, used a lot in Victoria. Both of those predicted very large flames. Now, if you can see right down that and the bottom left of that, uh, the dark gray means that you can direct attack those flames because they're small enough. And then the next level up, you can use parallel attack on that. And Frame was predicting that most of the time you could directly attack that fire and that the fire severity would be very low. And that is exactly what we saw there. 
And you can see on the right hand side that they attempted to backburn that forest, um, largely, I'm guessing, on the advice of fire models that said there's a lot of fuel there. It's 700 years since fire, so it's dangerous. But in reality, um, even though those red dots showed that there, you know, there was there was a heat signature picked up by the satellite, the severity was too low to measure. So it could have been controllable with a RACO, with sprinklers or with those sorts of mechanisms. So I'll finish just by making that point that once we understand how forests work, specific forest communities, then we can start understanding where the lines are and make informed decisions to say we can put remote area crews into this area and aggressively contain it and we don't have to fall back to less effective strategies like backburning. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, it's really epic to have, you know, your dual perspectives here as both like a um, on the ground remote firefighter um, and, you know, studier of the bigger picture. So um, really appreciate you um, coming in to share the, yeah, the deep dive of, um, uh, yeah, why remote area firefighting um, can be so important in um, these really complex landscapes. Um, I think that question of prioritization is a really big one because it's so painful to see every time after a bushfire how much bush we can lose from small ignitions that turned so big because they weren't um, you know uh, given attention early and so um, I hope these are all things we can take on board um, in Victoria if we um, when we secure our own remote area um, team Thank you so much. Um, I'll now hand over to our next speaker who is Jordan Crook from the Victorian National Parks Association as the Park Protection and Nature Campaigner. Um, and Jordan's gonna talk about how in the context of the climate crisis, we can continue to protect the national park estate and its rich biodiversity. Thank you, Anna. I'll just try and figure this out. Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> my name's Jordan from the Victorian National Parks Association. I'm on Wurundjeri country um, in Yarra Junction, in one of the most fire prone places in the world, apparently. And um, it's uh, nice and wet, and let's hope it stays that way this fire season. Um, so again, yeah, not a firefighter, um, have studied it, but ne never went into being a volunteer in the end. Um, but I have a, about a decade's worth of experience in uh, tree risk assessment and tree management, as well as in conservation land management. And just a quick one, so the VMPA is um, a not-for-profit group, much like um, Friends of the Earth, um, but we focus a bit more on uh, the protection of national parks and protected areas, um, and we're very old. <laughs> um, and a great, great man who used to work at the VMPA, Phil Ingemals, and before him, Jenny Barnett, um, both did amazing work on, on fire and trying to find that uh, balance and appropriate use of fire in protected areas and, and national parks. Um, and looking after those biodiversity values while also reducing that uh, risk of fire. And we live in a fire related landscape and fire is not the enemy, um, was a really poignant quote of Phil's that I, I pulled out of one of his many submissions. Um, and I guess in uh, BMPA's view, um, Fire management in Victoria is a little bit broken at the moment. Um, it's not kept up um, with the changing climate being 1.5 degrees warmer. Um, and DECA now was DALP, um, hasn't kept up um, and it's been slightly resistant to um, moving on to a bit more of a um, coordination with country and working with country <clears throat> such as Jara and um, Phil Zilstra has spoken about today. And 
there's been many examples, including some of their own work um, that shows how we're managing fire at the moment and using fire as a management tool isn't really working. This um, table was much like the one Sarah had uh, before. And I hope you can see uh, my mouse here, but um, these are the last three or four million plus hectare fires that have happened in the last 20, 25 years. Um, and the yellow is the prescribed fire or um, fuel reduction uh, fire. And if you put this map against the, uh, the warming of the climate, it, it all meets up and using only fuel reduction burns as the only tool to combat um, fire risk in Victoria um, is, is not a great way forward and not a safe way forward. And we know that um, wildfire, but very much so uh, high frequency fires have a huge impact on the natural ecology of forest and forest dependent plants, animals and fungi. And it's listed, it's in the law um, that the loss of hollow bearing trees, the um, inappropriate fire regimes and fire regimes that cause declines in biodiversity uh, are meant to be um, remitterated by state agencies, but isn't currently happening in our view. Um, and one of the main ways that we can protect our parks and protect nature is to have some oversight and regulation of forest fire management, Victoria. And these are three uh, quick issues that I'll run through that's happening in, in the parks and um, across Victoria. We've got a huge fuel break program um, based off questionable intent and um, almost the wiping out of hollow bearing and large old trees across public land tenures as part of those fuel breaks and as well as other fire management works and then rogue logging attempts from the Cobors, Wombat Forest to the Dandenong Ranges National Park. Uh, yeah, so following the 2019-20 uh, fires, large fuel breaks uh, were created along roadsides and the like, and then um, logs taken and sold. Um, the timber and pulp industry at the time was uh, looking for logs due to um, now successful court cases by conservation groups. Um, the logs were taken under some weird kind of shifty uh, rules at the time. And there's now plans um, to create a hell of a lot more fuel breaks across all land tenures, park, um, state forest, conservation reserves and the like. And if it goes ahead, um, will be equivalent to about half the size of Wilson's Prom. Um, and as Phil touched on, the fuel breaks are used for getting people to fires, but predominantly for uh, back burning exercises. And back burning exercises don't always uh, have the best results that uh, folks are looking for in those high fire danger times. So the fuel breaks, um, we've asked for all the evidence that they'll work. No one's been able to provide evidence that um, clearing 7,000 kilometres of new fuel breaks is going to help reduce any fire risk. The other one is the uh, clearing of large and hollow bearing trees. Um, as someone who's worked in tree risk assessment and um, management, this is very disappointing. If this was to happen in Melbourne, there'd be protests for days. Um, and the loss of these trees is the loss of three, 400 year old um, years of growth and the animals and plants that rely on these large old trees, a lot of the time have nowhere else to go. And they're felled um, under some very weird, in my opinion, um, tree risk uh, assessment methods uh, used by forest fire management. And 
very simple methods of removal of just scarfing and falling over trees instead of climbing them and uh, potentially salvaging and salvaging the hollows while retaining the tree while reducing the risk of the tree falling on anyone. And then the third, um, this one is a campaign with the Sun Dandenong's Land Care Group. Um, there was attempts to broad acre collect fallen trees in the Dandenong Ranges National Park, including the removal of standing hazardous trees and the selling of those trees commercially uh, by Big Forest from the National Park, facilitated by forest fire management. It was going to be a 100 hectare uh, program and it's been wound down to 50 hectares. Um, but quite a lot of state and Commonwealth listed species have been found by citizen scientists and, and concerned locals that have scaled the program back. Um, again, no evidence um, has been provided to show that the logs have increased fuel risk. Uh, we've done our own assessments using the Deca Green Book um, that shows the fuel risk is high in the areas that were burnt three years ago, which aligns quite heavily with um, Dr. Zilstra's work um, and his findings. Um, these operations happen in the Sylvan water catchment by Melbourne Water. Um, and you can see logs were collected all the way up to the water's edge. Um, this all being under the guise of fire management. And then we've got what forest fire management are doing out uh, in the Wombat Forest, as well as the Cobor Special Protection Zone. Um, and the reason this is allowed to go ahead while the rest of the native forest logging industry has stopped um, is because fire management um, by forest fire management has no regulatory body to oversee fire management in Victoria. Um, so forest fire management say they're doing a good job. They'll keep telling themselves good job Angus kind of moment for forest fire management. And the, what we're finding in the Dandenongs, it seems to be very much the tail wagging the dog in some of these operations where there's the commercial incentive to remove fallen trees or standing hazard trees um, that are of not no risk, but lower risk. Um, and the tail being the outcome of reduced fire risk, but the main priority seems to be to get the logs out in lengths that they're merchantable and usable from the timber industry. Other ideas um, that the VMPAs put forward for decades um, is much um, like Dr. Silsha was talking about, the increased rapid aerial attack capabilities as well as increased um, surveillance and compliance um, on high fire danger days to catch fire bugs before they light fires. Risk-based fuel reduction, we know 10,000 hectare fuel reduction burns won't save many lives, won't protect much assets, but doing more frequent um, fires or mowing closer to assets will have a better impact. So 100, 120 metres around those assets and incorporating the Indigenous um, knowledge through trials and um, understanding where to apply that fire in the context of a, of a colonised state now that is over 70% cleared um, under bitumen concrete and um, paddocks. Uh, if you want to learn a bit more, um, we've got some presentations by Phil Zilstra and another one by the late but great um, Phil Ingemels. And that's me. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jordan. Uh, it's really great to have you here as part of an organisation that has you know, secured crucial protection for our national parks and the unique landscapes they can serve for so many decades. Um, and, you know, want to 
note the enormous win this year with the, the final, the ban on native forest logging brought forward that um, the NPA has been one of the groups that's worked hard for years to um, achieve that massive win. So great to hear from you. Not without Fo's help. <laughs> we um, would figure that. And for our final speaker, before we get on to questions, um, I'd like to introduce Cam Walker, who is Friends of the Earth's Campaigns Coordinator um, and also CFA volunteer. So Cam uh, has been leading on Friends of the Earth's fire policy for years now and will give an overview of a proposal for new firefighting opportunities for city-based people in Victoria, uh, as well as talking more generally about some of our fire policy ideas and his experience. Over to you, Cam. Thanks, Anna. Um, and thanks to all the speakers. It's been absolutely fantastic to have you here. Um, so uh, we have a proposal, and I guess I just need to pop it into context. So there's kind of three key conversations that are happening here. The first one, as we heard from Sarah, is that climate change is making our fire seasons longer and more intense, et cetera. So we need radical climate mitigation in line with what the science says. Then we have the, the, the uh, fraught issue of land management, which includes uh, fuel reduction burning, of course, but also adaptation. So where do we build? How do we build? How does human habitation exist in vegetated landscapes in a time of climate change? And then the third part of the conversation, of course, is firefighting. And that's really what we're focused on tonight. And so we're not able to address all the bigger issues. We are interested in doing a, a forum specifically on land management next year. So if you're interested in that, please, let's have a yarn. And so our proposal, which is for a Victorian based um, raft, as, as Phil uh, described them, remote area firefighting team, uh, is basically uh, an attempt to build capacity for firefighting in Victoria. So it's fully understanding you've got those other conversations and this isn't about that. It's simply about that early ignition um, that Jordan was just uh, referencing. And in putting up a proposal, uh, it's in no way, shape or form a criticism of existing career firefighters or existing volunteer firefighters. It's simply saying that we need to have more people that are actually able to be involved. And we are aware that particularly the volunteer services and particularly as seasons get longer, it's hard to sustain involvement, you know, and we are losing volunteers. And a part of the issue at present is we have kind of three key zones where we draw volunteers from rural and farming areas, regional towns, and the peri-urban fringe. And the peri-urban fringe, those brigades are often in really good shape because they're growing and they've got really mixed communities. But it's often the regional areas, the farming areas, which are overall aging, are struggling to maintain their volunteer membership. And so we're thinking, well, what are the ways, how do we actually you know, find ways to, to top that up? Um, and our proposal, it's not a silver bullet, and we're mindful of the many things we need to do. Sarah talked about some of the adaptation measures we need to um, undertake or consider. Some of the things we think are, are really important are we need more career firefighters, uh, and in particular, we argue for project firefighters. So they're the people that are put on just for fire season, not year round. We think it's really important that we, if we're going to be increasing firefighting crews, I think we have about 550 project firefighters on this summer. That's where we need to keep building rather than the year round firefighting. We need more repel crews. So in Victoria, people getting into remote areas. In some states, they winch them in in Victoria. We uh, abseil or repel out of helicopters. Very expensive, but really important. We need in to continue to build our air capacity. Um, we really need on a federal level to get on with building or, or creating a national publicly owned fleet of large air tankers. So they're the very, very large planes, Boeing 737 uh, type size. In an average summer in Australia, we need six or seven of them. We only have two at present that are kind of based here permanently, one's owned by the, uh, uh, the RFS in New South Wales and one is here on a permanent leasing uh, basis. So we need to get on with that. That was a recommendation that came out of the Bushfire Royal Commission. We need to find ways to continue to uh, build support 
for existing volunteers and we need to look, I think, into payment options for really long summers when people are doing long stints away from home on strike teams. And uh, we also really need to look into the concept of the uh, or the proposal from the Federal Emergency Minister, um, Murray Watts, who's talking about the concept of a semi-professional national firefighting force. So that's the context. And to our proposal, what we are proposing is for a volunteer raft, remote area firefighting team, which would be based in the CFA. That is the logical home, of course. And the CFA has many specialist groups already. In my area, we have people who are involved in a group called Oscar One, which does mine rescues. We have, I believe, even a little coastal, a couple of coastal brigades uh, that use boats. We have um, a high angle rescue and advanced motor vehicle rescue and advanced hazardous materials um, operations. So there is a, a really deep history of doing this sort of specialised work. Um, these volunteers would be trained in dry firefighting techniques. So it is different to what we do at present, which is basically work off a truck or work off a hydrant. Um, and we're fully mindful that you need experience to do that. We're not suggesting we round up a bunch of uni students and drop them in the Wanangatta Valley. You know, we're fully mindful you need years of work to be ready to do this sort of work. And we're, we're very mindful of the fact we're proposing a different way of doing volunteer firefighting in Victoria. It's not instead of, it's as well as, so moving into dry firefighting, um, but also understanding since the Linton disaster, um, we are very cautious about where we put our people and no one wants people to die on the fire ground. So we understand we're proposing something that just in terms of the inherent caution of not putting people at risk um, is at odds with where we're at at present. And we also cooperate with forest fire management Victoria often working on public responsible. So we understand there are many complexities here and we understand uh, that makes some people feel like, well, what's the point? Why do it? And we would argue why do it is because the absolute vast majority of people who live in Victoria can't volunteer for firefighting unless they're willing to give up their summer and go away from November till March um, and be a project firefighter for FFNV. You just can't do it. Where I live, my call out time from getting a pager alert is four minutes to get to the station. If you're in the peri-urban fringe, it's probably eight minutes, something like that. We know that the absolute vast majority of the four and a half million people who live in Melbourne don't live eight minutes from a, from a brigade. And we know that we're struggling to hold on to our volunteers. And we know in urban areas, there are many people who love wild places. They love their national parks. Often they're very fit. Often they know the country very well. And I've, I've met so many, you know, bushwalkers and birdos and orienteers and mountain bike riders and backcountry skiers who'd love to be involved in this. And they know the country actually pretty intimately. Um, and these people who might be interested are very likely to be younger and diverse. And I think that's really aligned with what the CFA is attempting to do by bringing a greater diversity of people into the brigades. We need them to really represent the broader community rather than a subset of the community. Um, th this proposal really grew from my experience in Black Summer where I kept seeing lightning strikes that weren't knocked off. And we asked permission in many circumstances to be able to walk in to knock off fires that were essentially campfires. We weren't allowed to because we didn't have dry fire fighting capacity. And we basically, in some instances, had to wait until they turned into fires. And there was the fire, several fires at Mount Tabletop near Mount Hotham. Uh, after a couple of days, the wind picked up. It went on to almost burn uh, the dinner playing village down twice. It went down into Kobungra, it threatened houses there. It burnt almost to Omeo. It burnt well over 40,000 hectares of land. And if we had been able to, as Phil said before, we'd be, if we'd been able to get crews in there, we might have been able to nip it in the bud and that would have been 43,000 hectares that didn't burn that summer. And what happens in those circumstances, much of the east of the state was on fire then. There were the evacuations in Malakuta. There was a, you know, a hell of a time trying to find the resources to go around. And there was a remarkable moment that um, 
The second time the fire came to Dinner Plain, someone somewhere in an incident control centre managed to um, detour a large air tanker over Dinner Plain and it basically stopped the fire in its tracks and saved the village. The first time the village was saved by a wind shift, second time was saved by a large air tanker. But in those circumstances, we abandon nature. We basically say human assets are the thing that we need to look after. And that's understandable because primarily we're responsible for, you know, human health and human safety. But the costs of that are enormous. And as we know, those fire sensitive communities and a reference them before snow gums, alpine ash are in the process of facing ecological collapse at present. And I'm aware that in Victoria, in the East, we have about 140,000 hectares of very immature alpine ash. If it's burnt again, we'll lose it. And we've been doing mapping around the loss of snow gum woodlands in the high country. And there are pockets expanding all the time of, of areas that have just been burnt you know, too many times, too frequently. They don't mind a burn every 50 years or 80 years, but now it's happening every 10 down to seven years. So this is where the proposal has come from. And we realised um, that there are already these rafts in other states. So in Queensland, in the ACT, in New South Wales, I understand New South Wales has 500 to 1,000 raft um, uh, members who are active. Um, Tasmania has a slightly different model, as I understand it. WA is in the process of establishing their teams. So it just makes sense to us that we set one up. And the reason, uh, another reason we really like this idea is you have no standing force that you have to maintain when you don't need them. So apart from bringing new people into the fight, you're not paying to have them sit around. Um, the figures that I've heard from people who are raft assessors and trainers in New South Wales is it's going to cost you $1,500 to $2,000 to train and equip people who already have fire qualifications who are willing to do the training to become raft firefighters. And we'd say, you know, that's a really remarkable uh, kind of very cost effective way to bring people in. And it gets people in the country to have a sense of being involved in the solutions. And the process by which we reckon this could happen is in a three-stage process. The first stage could happen now. Our estimate is it would cost $150,000 to $200,000. So an absolute, you know, a couple of coins at the back of the couch for a state government. And what you would do is bring trainers down from New South Wales or Queensland. They already have the curriculum. They're already willing to train us. And we would put a call out for people who live in Melbourne who live too far from a station to volunteer, but who have previous experience, either as a career or a volunteer firefighter. So in that first round, you bring those people in that already have the general firefighter experience or previous raft experience, you do the qualification, you get them out in the field. Then at the end of that season, obviously you evaluate and then hopefully you scale up. The second part of this is what they do in New South Wales and elsewhere, which is to invite expressions of interest from existing members in rural and regional brigades. So as I understand it in New South Wales, most districts will have a raft, it will have a trailer with all its equipment. It might have 15 or 20 people who can be come out of their brigades um, and then be deployed. But we'd say this new system, if we rely on, rely on urban people, we're adding to the volunteer base rather than in effect cannibalizing the volunteer base. So that's why we think going to new urban people is really, really important, but we should open it up also to people already active in brigades and they could be the second stage of people that nominate in. And then the final stage, which could happen from the end of next summer, which would cost more, but we're really heartened that the CFA is talking about finding opportunities for Melbourne people to be involved in firefighting. And there's this great program that's being trialed at present called uh, Vols on Holes. So if you're a firefighter and you go down the coast for summer, you can nominate to opt in to perhaps turn out with Malacuta or Lawn or whatever. If that were to be turned into an ongoing program whereby Melbourne people could opt in, get their general firefighter qualifications, do their burn over drill, do their hazardous trees, do all the things you need to do to be competent to be out on a truck and fighting fires, that potentially then becomes the pathway by which we could get hundreds of remote area firefighters over probably a two to three year period. People come in through a more mainstream CFA program like Vols on Holes, they get the experience, they opt into the RAF program, they get their training and then they're deployed that way. 
So that's kind of the proposal. I'm very happy to um, answer questions, et cetera. Um, but while I have the microphone, can I just say a big thank you to Anna Langford, who has MC tonight and also came up with the idea for this forum. So thanks heaps, Anna. That's it for me. Awesome. Thank you, Cam. Um, thank you so much for uh, outlining the, you know, really exciting proposal that we've been pushing for for years. And it looks like we're actually getting pretty close to um, seeing become a reality in Victoria. Um, and yeah, you know, I think it's, it does present an exciting opportunity for so many different kinds of people who live in the city, including even young people who move to the city from the country and maybe want to move back later, but can't, you know, at the moment be part of a brigade while they're living in town. And um, yeah, it's just, it, I think it's a really great way to bring the city and country um, together with more solidarity when it comes to firefighting and protecting the places that um, we all benefit from, no matter where we live in Victoria from that. So we've got uh, about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Um, and I'll try and get um, at least one to each speaker, but thank you so much to everybody who's been putting your questions in the chat all evening. Um, I'll also just note quickly that I have posted the links in the chat for the action points that you can take as an individual or as a group to um, add weight to our proposal for the volunteer um, raft in Victoria. One of them is an individual, um, like a petition that you as an individual can sign. And another is an open letter to the Emergency Services Minister, Jacqueline Symes, that if you're part of an organisation, you can add your um, logo, which we'd really love to get some more on there. Um, but for now, I'm just going to go to all the questions we've been gathering from people. And the first one um, has been directed to Sarah, and it's about the question of labour capacity of volunteers um, as fires become more frequent um, from Peter. Um, so, yeah, the, the question is um, close, uh, close knowledge of local ecosystems um, and, you know, being a part of the community are key parts of firefighting. Um, and given the emerging context of more dangerous fires and more frequent fires, should we consider an additional reserve firefighter system like the Army Reserve of paid volunteers who are paid and formally committed to working with local communities for a designated period of time? Um, so it's been addressed to you, Sarah, but also if anyone else wants to comment after, you're welcome to. Yeah, thank you. I did spot that one in the chat addressed to me. I'm probably not the right person to respond to this. Um, I'm sure it's much more complex than, than I'm aware of, and there's probably a whole heap of history and, and reasons behind it. I know that Cam touched on it as one of the op options, and I have heard about it, but, yeah, I can't comment on, on why or why not um, volunteers um, we should or shouldn't be paid. I, I mean, there's a whole heap of volunteers in this room, so I'd love to hear what their thoughts are, are on something like that. Um, yeah, and I, I, Cam was commenting on it before as well, but I think he's just fallen out of the Zoom temporarily. <laughs> um, we might have, he might have lost internet. Um, so uh, I'll, hopefully he comes back in in a tick. Um, but, um, yeah, do, do any of the other speakers want to touch on that? Maybe Phil, yeah, you've also been a firefighter. Yeah, I, I suppose, particularly given the way that our fire seasons are lengthening and the number of fires we're getting, where we're getting, you know, typically a fire season starts up north and moves south, and so you often have... Um, people from the south uh, of, of the country who have started fighting fires, you know, in spring and worked their way down the coast and uh, are exhausted by the time fire, you know, actually gets started down in their area. And, you know, I, I suppose to me there's just, just that question that, you know, we knew that climate change was giving us more fires and we there's there's an issue for us to answer in how much we want people to 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 combat the effects of climate change for free 
you know, I, I think, you know, climate change, we knew it was happening. We knew it was going to happen with it. And there is a place now for governments to step in and say, we made decisions that that helped give us the climate change we've got. And we can't expect everyone to mitigate those things for free because it's it's a massive ask on people. It you know I even even as a paid firefighter in the past, um, I saw families break apart when you had a long fire season. You know it's it's a huge emotional toll on people, and and there needs to be more resources in place to uh, to enable people to give their time. Thanks, Bill. Um, and we've just welcomed Cam back into the Zoom room. Bit of dodgy internet happening. Yeah, well, sorry. Always fun. Um, I might um, I might throw a question to Ben or combine a couple we've had um, about the uh, cultural burning programs. Um, and yeah, it's uh, so we've got a question asking about how the um, ancient cultural burning practices are kind of adapting to the um, you know, anthropogenic induced climate change that's changing the landscape. Um, and uh, also about kind of, you know, what are the, like how big are the areas of land that that they burn um, and what's the kind of effect on the landscape? So a, a couple there, but I thought I'd combine them. Oh gosh, yes. Um, so the, the short answer is we're very early into this process of reintroducing fire into the landscape with a massive surge in the last year and a half. So we we can't really draw any you know early conclusions um, yet. We're, we've been putting a lot of work into setting up a biocultural monitoring and evaluation program to try and better understand not just the, the ecological impacts of what we're doing, but the, the, the social benefits, the economic benefits, other benefits for, for JARA and the broader community. But um, a lot of those things are just sort of in, in development. Um, we, we've got our public facing strategy that's about to come out the first quarter of next year. Um, that will outline our priorities for the next 10 years or so. And, we, and we've been working on our operating procedures to try and consistently be able to return year after year to patches that we burn so that we can consistently manage it. But we are very early in, in the, the journey um, and within a very difficult, you know, regulatory context. Um, we're, we're, we're the largest, as far as I know, the largest traditional owner led burning program in the state. Um, and, and all of that's been very hard fought in terms of trying to work through those processes to get as many burns on ground as, as we possibly can. Um, I don't know if one of my team members, Leanne, is on anymore, but like if, if she is or isn't, she's our um, PhD in fire ecology in, in our team who has set up the monitoring program and probably knows a few people um, on here as well. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a journey, I think, some of the early sites that we've seen, in particular sites where it's been low intensity, we have seen the turn of Merlot or Yam Daisy and the different um, food and fiber plants and, and some promising signs, but I wouldn't be, you know, putting any, you know, in, any broad strokes of, of what we're seeing yet. Like, I think we're in the early stages of reintroducing the fire and that will do whatever we can to give more updates and all sorts of creative and interesting ways as we get more information, but we're still on the journey. Yeah, yeah thank you, Ben. And um, acknowledge that it's, um, you know, the, the majority of the forum um, isn't as much focused on the bigger picture of that, but that it would be great to do more of a deep dive into it um, next year um, so we can properly explore those things. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that one. Um, I know, I think Cam is um, speedily answering things in the chat, but I'll um, throw one to you that a couple of people have um, asked about uh, Fo's position on the, like supporting the development of drone detection of lightning strikes and fire. Um, might also be one that you want to take, Phil, afterwards, but 
um, yeah, quite a few people interested in um, drone detection um, as a technique. Um, look, I support the ongoing ad, uh, you know, adoption of new technologies, but as with climate change, we get obsessed with technology. And I would say that at its core, firefighting is about good crews on the ground, good equipment, good training, and all the logistics that goes in behind that, the food and all the other things that makes firefighting possible. And I can see as with burning, there's this emerging kind of industry that's salivating at the prospect of making big bucks off, you know, AI predicting where fires will start and swarms of drone, drones putting all the spot fires out. So I understand the need for us to keep adopting ideas, but I'd say, look, we have all these staff fire towers and they do a great job, you know, and let's keep the good stuff. Uh, so it's kind of like an, you know, analog, we need an analog solution, not just thinking that we're going to have a digital solution that will solve us. So open to ideas, but yeah, let's always remember this is about people working on the ground and in the air. Yeah, I suppose just, just to add to that, I, I, I thoroughly agree. You can't replace raft crews with drones and, and that technology, but what you can do, I think, is fill in some of the gaps. So with the, the Gospers Mountain example that I gave, when they first found the fire, it was four hectares, but they couldn't put people out there because it was too dangerous to, to winch people in. What you can do with drones, you can't put out a fire in a hollow tree because you can't drop water on top of it. And that, that will get into the tree. You know, There's a lot of work um, for raft crews in, in getting water physically into a hollow tree. So you need people on the ground. But what a drone can do, when, or a water glider, uh, as they're developing at ANU, is to actually get water to contain that area. If you detect that fire fast enough, then you can actually get resources out there. While it's too dangerous to get humans into the air, you can get in some rapid um, containment that will actually slow the spread of that fire before humans get there. And I think that's probably the the niche that it can fill. It will never replace raft crews, but what it will do is buy us time. Thanks, Phil and Cam. Um, I think we, I know we're coming up to the end and I feel like we could talk about this for hours, but um, probably just got time for one or two more questions before wrapping up. Um, this one, one of the earlier ones um, in the night asked by Nick is um, about fuel reduction and um, carbon. So uh, it's how do bushfire strategies and practices need to change to accommodate not just climate change, but also an imminent future in which much more carbon is being grown in the landscape on Crown and private land as a result of public and private sector offsets um, investments. Um, land regulated land clearing or offsets to greenhouse gas emissions um, or for efforts to restore and rebuild healthy land, water and biodiversity. Um, does anyone feel like they can speak to that one? It wasn't addressed to anyone in particular. Yeah, Phil? Sorry, I don't want to always be the one <laughs> answering it, but... Um, um, from what we've measured empirically across the country so far, the the least flammable forests, you you've got two options. One is to either burn it really, really frequently, and much more frequently than we are generally doing. So, like the Gospers Mountain example again, took about two years. It, that's that's the period there where it had it. So frequent enough that you are clearing vegetation, losing species and maintaining an open understory. So that's suitable for specific locations where there is that, that priority is seen to outweigh um, the cost of it. But across the broad landscape, what we are measuring is that the, the places that burn least often also have the highest carbon storage. Um, there isn't a conflict. We often talk about there being a balance between environmental values and risk reduction as if the two are in conflict and we have to make some sort of compromise between the two. What that is, is our short term experience of it where we see regrowth and we see that understory coming back and the landscape getting more flammable and we think we expect it's going to stay that way. 
But the ecology of a forest means that it won't stay, stay that way. Eventually, the vegetation will change and it becomes a less flammable landscape with a, uh, more of that biomass in the overstory and less of it down near the ground where it can burn. And so, so there isn't a conflict with carbon storage. The question for us is how to get our forests to that stage. And that's where we really need strategic thinking. And that will absolutely involve um, greatly enhanced rapid detection and suppression. Thanks, Phil. Did anyone else want to comment on that one? Or are we good for that? Awesome. Uh, I'll only comment that it was awesome to, to hear lots of Phil's insights, including that one. Thank you. Yeah, we we're, feel very lucky to have you here, Phil. <laughs> um, it is 8.30 and I don't want to keep people too late on a Thursday night, um, this, you know, close to the end of the year. Um, but I'll just note a couple of things as we wrap up. Um, firstly, huge thanks again to our speakers who have come on tonight to share uh, their different expertise on this really important issue, which is only going to grow in importance over the 21st century. Um, it's been really wonderful to have um, your different areas of expertise um, on, yeah, like what I think we all understand is um, a huge issue, but not necessarily the holistic um, picture. Um, Cam has put his email in the chat and said he's happy to answer people's questions if we didn't get to them tonight and you want to email them again to him. Um, and yeah, like we hope to do more of this, holding these um, convos on this theme next year. So keep an eye out on our um, newsletter and website for uh, more events in 2024. Um, I'll just reiterate the action points from the evening, which we'll email to everyone to um, tomorrow, which are the um, petition for anyone to sign in support of creating a Victorian volunteer raft. Um, and the open letter, which is addressed to the Victorian government that organisations can sign on to. Um, and Jordan has also put in the chat the resource he noted during his presentation, um, which I'm, I'm happy to send out in the email um, tomorrow as well to everyone. Um, and also just a final thank you to Patch, one of our faux volunteers who has been very studiously collating everyone's questions over the night and colour coding them for me by theme so that I don't have to sift around too much to um, yeah get through the pile of awesome questions we've had. Um, so yeah, I think with that, um, just thanks so much everyone for coming. We'll have a recording to send out and um, yeah, I hope you all stay safe over summer. Um, and stay involved in the new year. Thanks all. Take it easy. Thanks all.